All right, welcome to the last week of Math 340. Today we're going to continue 7a, talking about self-adjoint and normal operators. Let me just remind you, last time uh, we defined the adjoint of a linear map. Right? So if t is a linear map from a vector space v to a vector space w, and I think here we're assuming always finite dimensional inner product spaces, then the adjoint t star is a map that goes in the opposite direction from w to v and satisfies this property where if you, I mean, just the property that's written, if you take the inner product in w of t, v, and w, that's always the same thing as taking the inner product in v of v with t star w. Okay, so in general, t and t star, these live in different spaces, right? t star lives in the linear maps from w to v, and t lives in the linear maps from v to w. However, if t is actually an operator on v, right, if it goes from v to v, then the adjoint is also an operator on v, right, because then the domain and the codomain are the same. And then you could ask subtler questions about the relationship between a linear map and its adjoint, because now they're operators on the same space, right, so you can sort of compare them in other ways. So it's exactly what we'll do today. We'll talk about self-adjoint and normal operators. Okay, so if T is actually an operator, then T star is also an operator. And so we can compare them. I'm being deliberately vague here, right? Of course, in general, the, the relationship between, even if you're talking about an operator, in general, the relationship between T and its adjoint is still the same, right? It's still T, let's say V1, V2, to make clear that everything is happening in V. In general, this is the most that you can say about a function, or an operator versus its adjoint, because this is just the definition of what it means to be the adjoint. But maybe a very natural notion is you could ask, OK, well, when are t and t star actually the same linear map? That makes sense, because they're both operators on the same space. So they could be equal. right? If that happens, we say that t is self-adjoint. So an operator T on V is called self-adjoint if T equals T star. So the terminology is good. It's the adjoint of itself, right? In other words, if sort of you can, okay, I'm going to stick with the notation in the notes. Uh, in other words, to be self-adjoint means that you can sort of, in some sense, push the t to the other slot of an inner product anytime you take an inner product, right? Because this is the property that the adjoint enjoys. So if t is its own adjoint, then itself it enjoys the same property. Okay, so what are the examples? Well, the place we should look for examples is always uh, Euclidean space with the Euclidean inner product. So if we fix the standard basis, which is an orthonormal basis, if Fn and T is a linear operator, then we can write the matrix M of T with respect to the standard basis. And we know that uh, M of T star is the the conjugate transpose, again, with respect to this standard basis, because that's an orthonormal basis. So you'll have that T is self-adjoint if and only if the matrix of T is actually equal to its conjugate transpose. So T is self-adjoint. It's if and only if the matrix of T is equal to its conjugate transpose. So we can quickly write down some examples, right? 
So if I want this matrix to be equal to its conjugate transpose, then along the diagonal, I need to take real numbers. Because if I put uh, if I put like a anything imaginary here into the conjugate transpose, I'd get a negative i when I uh, conjugated it, right? So definitely the the diagonal needs to be actual real numbers, even if we're working over C. And then in the other entries, if you have like some 2i here, then when you take the conjugate transpose, well, maybe you'll see that you have to have the conjugate across the, and if you have a real number somewhere, then you'll get and take its conjugate on the, I'll circle on the opposite side. Right, so if you take the conjugate transpose of this matrix, you'll see that it's equal to itself. So this gives uh, a self-adjoint operator from C3 to C3. OK, of course, if f equals r, then the conjugate transpose is just the transpose. Then t is self-adjoint. If only if m of t is equal to its transpose, which just means that m of t is symmetric. So the notion of a self-adjoint operator is the same thing as a symmetric matrix with respect to some choice of orthonormal basis. OK, so note from this example, uh, I guess uh, maybe I should say, OK, from this example, we see is that somehow to be self-adjoint is kind of like being equal to your conjugate in some way. This is just by analogy. So if you think about so being, uh, being self-adjoint, this is if and only if you're equal to your conjugate. So the way to think about a self-adjoint matrix, or sorry, self-adjoint linear operator, is it it like plays the role some in some sense of like the real numbers inside of the complex numbers, because if if you take a complex number and you conjugate it, and it is equal to itself, that means that your number to start with is real. Okay, so this is just a useful analogy to sort of have in your head that. Again, just analogy that uh, self adjoint operator is kind of like everything here is in quotes, uh, a real number in C. That is sometimes a useful analogy to keep in mind. Okay, so that's a self adjoint operator. Before we prove anything about that, let me define a normal operator. And a normal operator, again, it's going to be some property. It's going to be an operator that satisfies some property that is a relationship between T and its adjoint. Because you can, compare, you can compare them since they both live in the same space of operators on V. So the definition is just the following. An operator T on V is called normal, a normal operator, if it commutes with its adjoint. In other words, if t t star equals t star t. Right, again, we can only, this equation only makes sense because t and t star are operators on the same vector space v. Right, so uh, since they're operators on V, you can either do first do T star and then do T, or you can first do T and then do T star. These both yield operators on V. And then you can say, are these two the same operator? So that's what a normal operator is, right? Just a remark that this is a, a weaker notion than being self-adjoint. Right. In other words, self-adjoint 
implies normal, but not the other way around. Let me do it like this, not the other way around, right? Because if T is self, if T is self adjoint, then T T star is just T squared, which is the same thing as T star T. So you, you get this normal property for free. So this is a weaker notion, a weaker relationship that an operator can have with its adjoint. So our, our example should be some kind of matrix. So let's let T from C2 to C2 be the operator whose matrix with respect to the standard basis so again that's a nice orthonormal basis is uh, say 2i 3 minus 3 minus i okay so this matrix is not equal to its own conjugate transpose because it has non-real numbers along the diagonal, right? So this is the matrix of T. The matrix of T star will be the conjugate transpose. So you have to conjugate everything and then transpose it across. These two matrices are not the same. So they're not, they don't give the same linear map, but we can do this multiplication, right? Even I can multiply two two by two matrices uh, watch, I'm about to make a mistake. I already made a mistake writing down the matrix. Uh, so let's see, 2i times negative 2i, that's 4, plus 3 times 3, that's 13. 2i times negative 3, that's negative 6i, plus 3i, that's negative 3i. Uh, negative 3 times negative 2i, that's negative 6. Uh, sorry. That's positive 6i minus 3i. That's positive 3i. And then minus 3 times minus 3, that's 9 plus 1. That gives you 10. And then you can check if you multiply them in the other order. You can check that you get the same matrix. In the, so in other words, t and t star, well, the, their matrices commute. Therefore, the linear operators commute. And so t, t star equals t star t. So t is normal, but not self adjoint. OK, so in the matrix fra phrasing, once you've fixed an orthonormal basis of your vector space to say that a operator is normal is to say that it for the in, in the matrix setting it commutes with its own conjugate transpose yeah there's lots of theorems that sort of tell you more things about normal operators but basically these these two properties are some nice properties that a linear operator can have with respect to its adjoint and you know we don't really have all that much more time in this class to discuss it sort of in chapter seven, the rest of chapter seven in the textbook, there's lots of uh, examples of how normal operators are like some of the nicest possible operators. And therefore self adjoint operators are even nicer, right? Because it's a, it's a, it's a stronger notion than normal. Uh, but, you know, I fear we're not gonna really get to that, but it would be good to define them and talk about some basic properties so let's prove some basic properties. So one, if S and T are both linear operators in V that are self-adjoint, so if you take two self-adjoint operators, then if you take their sum, this is self-adjoint. And if you scale and multiply them by a real number, and T is self-adjoint. Uh, I guess I've already said that T is self-adjoint.
Okay, so we'll we'll see in a second why we need why we need real. Okay, but basically uh, we've proved something about uh, summing and taking adjoints already. Right, so I'll 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 flash back in a second, but if you take S plus T and you take its adjoint, you want to know, is this the same thing as S plus T? But let's not forget that we proved some things about adjoints. For example, we proved that uh, the adjoint of the sum is the sum of the adjoints. That's this result here. The adjoint of the sum is the sum of the adjoints. That's true here too. This is S star plus T star. But now since S is self-adjoint, that's S. Since T is self-adjoint, that's T. And so S plus T is also self-adjoint. OK, and then why do we need the real number part in the second part? It's because we proved that if you take the adjoint of the scalar multiple of a linear map, then you can pull the scalar out at the expense of taking a complex conjugate. So lambda t star is in general equal to lambda bar t star. Okay, but since lambda is real, that's just lambda. And since t is self-adjoint, that's lambda t. And so lambda t is also self-adjoint. Right, so this equality holds uh, if and only if. Uh, lambda is real. Uh, I guess maybe I sh maybe I sh what I should be, should be saying is okay. Since t is self adjoint, this is lambda bar of t, and this equality holds if only if lambda is actually real. That's why we need the the real hypothesis on lambda. Okay, so a way to say this is that over C the set of self-adjoint operators on a vector space is not a subspace, right? This is the, the correct way to think about it. So over C, the self-adjoint operators is not a subspace of V. Because if you scale by a non-real complex number, then you're not going to get a self-adjoint operator. It is, however, closed under addition. So I guess it's it's just it's a subgroup. Uh, over R, though, it is subspace because the self-adjoint operators are closed under addition and scalar multiplication. Okay, and remember the analogy I said to keep in mind, a helpful analogy is that the self-adjoint operators are kind of like the real numbers. So inside the complex numbers, if you add two real numbers, you of course get a real number. But if you scale a real number, you're not guaranteed to get a real number if you scale by a non-real complex number, right? So this proposition is an example of you could maybe expect this if you think of the self-adjoint operators as being analogous to the real numbers. Also a remark. This theorem is, uh, let's call it predictable via the analogy, the self-adjoint operators inside of Sorry, this should say L of V, of course. L of V is like the real numbers inside of C. Okay, here's another proposition where the analogy 
it's, it's actually maybe even a bit stronger than analogy. Every eigenvalue of a self adjoint operator is actually real. So here's another way in which they're like behaving like real numbers. All of their eigenvalues have to be real. Right, and of course, over the complex numbers, every operator has to have eigenvalues. If it's self-adjoint, then they all have to be real. And so here's the proof. So suppose T and LV is self-adjoint. And suppose that lambda is an eigenvalue. We want to show that lambda is real, right? What does it mean to say that T is self-adjoint? Well, since T is self-adjoint, we have that for every V and V, the inner product of TV and V is equal to V TV. We actually have a stronger statement, right? We actually have a, the statement for every V and W in V. This is true. But now what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose an eigenvector with eigenvalue lambda as both V and W. So choose V to be an eigenvector with eigenvalue lambda, which is guaranteed to exist since lambda is an eigenvalue. Then what do you get? You get TVV equals VTV, the original thing I wrote down. Let's just work outward. This is lambda VV. And you can pull the lambda out, out of the first slot to get lambda VV, which is, if you prefer, I mean, okay, this is, I'll just go all the way with what I have in my notes. The norm of V squared. On the other hand, this one is V lambda V, the inner product. But now when you pull out the scalar out of the second slot of an inner product, you have to take the complex conjugate. Okay, so this number equals this number. Also, V is a not a non-zero vector since it's an eigenvector. Right, so V is non-zero, which means its norm is non-zero. And the square of its norm is non-zero, which means that lambda has to actually equal lambda bar. Therefore, lambda is real. So every eigenvalue of a self-adjoint operator is real. Okay. Now we're going to prove sort of a lemma that we need for later. So the, this next result doesn't seem to be talking about self adjoint operators at all. In fact, I think in your notes, I, I'll call it a lemma rather than a proposition, which is what I've been calling most results. But it's a useful lemma. and. I need the result, so let's prove it. So suppose V is an inner product space over C. So the C is important here. And T is a linear operator on V. Suppose that TV is always orthogonal to V for every V and V. And then the result of this theorem is that the only way for this to happen is if T is actually the zero map. So if your linear operator always spits out an orthogonal vector, then the only way to do that is by collapsing everything to zero. It's kind of a strong statement. 
it's even kind of unexpected because whenever I imagine a vector space V, I always imagine it over R. I do anyway. And I can imagine a, an operator on a real vector space that does always spit out an orthogonal vector. So this, this is not true over R. What is the linear operator that I'm thinking of? It's the one that takes every vector and rotates it by an angle of 90 degrees. Right, so rotation, yeah, let's not call it 90 degrees, let's call it pi over two. Rotation by pi over two is the linear operator on R2, satisfying that it always spits out a vector that's orthogonal to its input. So to me, it seems like I can imagine an operator that, that would do this. When I imagine a vector space V, oh, you just always send something to something 90 degrees away. But it turns out it's not possible to do this non-trivially if you work over C. So, you know, I'm not sure how interesting this result is just on its own, but like I said, we, we need it to prove something else. So let's prove it. Sometimes you got to prove some things that you don't really care about in order to prove something that you do care about. And unfortunately, I think the proof is not that illuminating since it's basically just a computation. Okay. So here's the proof verify the following identity for every U and W and V. Okay. Here, here's the identity. Take the inner product of T, U, and W. This is equal to one fourth times the inner product of T, U plus W, comma, U plus W. minus one fourth times the inner product of t u minus w u minus w plus i over four the inner product of uh t u plus i w u plus i w minus i over four the inner product of t of u minus i w u minus i w Okay, so you can expand all these things out over the sums and then collect like terms and cancel some stuff out. And you'll see that you get exactly what's left over is the inner product of TU and W. All right, so it's not too illuminating. I, I did do it on my own, so you should do it on your own too. But the point is now that if, okay, and by the way, here I'm using complex scalars to do this, which is why over R, this proof doesn't work because over R, the, the result is false. However, now each of the terms here is of the form TV comma V, the inner product of TV and V, right? So this is by hypothesis, this is zero, this is zero, this is zero, this is zero. Right? So this is equal to zero for every u and w in v. Right, so this is true for every u and w. So just take w to be t of u. Fix a u and take w to be t of u. Then what this says is that t u comma t u, the inner product is zero. But this is the norm of TU squared. So this says that the norm of TU is equal to zero, which means that TU is equal to zero for every U. In other words, T is a zero map. Okay, so I think the proof is not that illuminating. It's just some clever algebra. So to be honest, I don't really have a really good intuition for why this lemma is true. Maybe if one of you has uh, a good intuition for it, you could email me and tell me. This is maybe one of the, the weaknesses of always thinking of vector spaces as being over R 
as being over R. Because if you only think over R, it seems like this result is false. OK. The reason why I wanted that result was to prove the following result, which is, again, another example. I'm really trying to drill this analogy home. That self-adjoint operators should be thought of analogously as the real numbers sitting inside of C. So suppose T, V is a complex inner product space, finite dimensional. And T is an operator. Then T is self-adjoint if and only if take the inner product of T, V, and V, it's a real number for every V and V. So taking the inner product, if you, if you take a self-adjoint operator, you, you apply T to a vector and take the inner product with the vector, it's always a real number. Of course, for a general operator, this is just some scalar in C, right? You take TV, it's something, you inner product it with V, that's just some scalar. But for the self-adjoint ones, it has this really nice property where if you apply, you apply the linear map and you take the inner product, you always get a real number. And saying something like the self-adjoint operators are something like real numbers. Okay, so let's let V be a vector in V. I want to show that the inner product of T, V, and V is real. I want to know that this number is real. OK, so one thing I could do to understand whether a scalar is real is you can subtract off its conjugate and see if you have anything left over. Right? So this is just an aside. So if you have a plus b i in C, if you want to know if this number is real or not, what you could do is you could take a plus b i and you could subtract off its conjugate. What, you, what you're left with is 2 b i. So if the number is real, then you'll get 0 here. And if it's not real, you'll get twice the imaginary part. So a thing to try here is to subtract off the conjugate of t v and b. Hey, why would you think this is a thing to try? Because if you use the self-adjoint property, then what you would do is you would flip the V and the TV. Like, I guess just the next step of this proof is why you would try this. Because right? you want to use the self-adjoint property somehow. But also, when you swap the TV and the V, you have to take the complex conjugate of the inner product. OK. But now, uh, it, wait, so isn't this just? Oh, see, so what am I doing here? I'm trying to prove both equivalences at the same time. OK, so I'm trying to do this totally in general. I'm not assuming that T is self-adjoint. I'm going to show you that you get this, both directions of the equivalence at the same time. So just in general, what you can do is you can push the T to the other side of this inner product at the expense of an adjoint. And this is equal to. I can now use the linearity or the additivity of the adjoint in the first slot to write this as TV minus T star V comma V. And then the difference of linear operators is something like this. So the difference between the inner product of TV and V and its conjugate is always 
this inner product of t minus t star applied to d and b. Okay, and this is real if and only if this difference equals zero, which is if and only if this is equal to zero. But maybe I should say T V and V, the this inner product is real for every V and V, if and only if this difference is zero for every V and V, if and only if this holds for every V and V. And now we're in the setting of this last lemma. What I've gotten is I've gotten an operator such that if I apply it to V and I take the inner product with V, I get zero for every V and V. That's this operator. So apply the previous lemma. to conclude that actually this must be the zero map. So uh, this lemma is of course also an if and only if, right? So we prove the hard direction that uh, if the inner product like this is zero, then T is a zero map. But of course, if T is a zero map, then you're always taking the inner product with V. So that's zero. So this is actually an if and only if. So to conclude that this happens if and only if T minus T star equals zero, which is if and only if T equals T star, which is if and only if T is self adjoint. Okay, so being self adjoint has a sort of weird real geometric property. Okay. Now we got about, no, we got some time left. We got still like 20 minutes left. Okay, so now let's turn our attention to normal operators. Okay, and then hopefully next time we can at least state the spectral theorem in the complex and the real cases, which will involve self-adjoint and normal operators, which is why we're developing this right now. Otherwise, you'd be totally justified in asking who cares about a self-adjoint operator, who cares about a normal operator. We'll see that in a really precise way, these are somehow like the nicest possible operators somehow. Okay, so now about normal operators, which again, are gonna be not quite as nice as self-adjoint operators, but still quite nice. So here's a, a nice result which characterizes them. So an operator on V is normal if and only if This is kind of a cool property. The norm of T V equals the norm of T star V for every V and V. Okay, so to be self adjoint means that you're equal to your adjoint. To be normal means you do the same thing to norms as your adjoint does. For every vector, you map, for every single vector v, you map v to maybe a different vector, but a vector that has the exact same norm as tv. Uh, but I was, I was telling somebody, maybe in office hours, that the word normal is like maybe the, one of the most overloaded words in mathematics. In like every field of mathematics, there's something called there's some adjective called normal, and it means something different almost entirely. Uh, so I don't think the fact that normal operators preserve norms in this way is why they're called normal operators. Uh, 
could be wrong though. I, I don't I don't know the history of the word, but that's neither here nor there. Let's prove this result. Okay, so let's let T be an operator. And let me just note that the operator T star T minus T T star, this is always self-adjoint. Here's a way to cook up a self-adjoint operator. You take any operator you want and you write down T star T minus T T star. Okay, this is just a computation. So let's see. So what is the adjoint of this map? Well, I know that I can break it up over the sum or the difference in this case. Right, I also know that I can maybe even point to it. If you have a composition, that's this result, you take the adjoint of each one and just reverse the order. Ah, uh, whoops. I actually want this screen. So this is the same thing as T star, T star, star minus T star, star, T star. But then you also know that if you take the adjoint twice, you get the original. So this shows that this operator T star, T minus T, T star is actually equal to its own adjoint. So it's always self-adjoint, no matter what T is. Right? Okay, so now we have that T is normal if and only if uh, T star T minus T T star equals zero. That's what it means to be normal. But uh, this is the same thing by uh, this previous result. Now I'm, uh, whoops, no, it's not. Ah, oh, gosh, okay. So I'm realizing that I just forgot to prove a result that I, I need to prove this one. Okay, so put this on hold for a second. Uh, this is really terrible pedagogy. Okay, so I've, I've forgotten to prove a <laughs> forgotten to prove a result that I wanted to prove. Okay, so here's the results, and I'm gonna need to talk about it. So you'll see in a second why I, I skipped past this in the notes. If you're a bit sleepy, which I am right now, uh, you're you're liable to to skip past this. So suppose that T is a self-adjoint operator on V such that the inner product of TV V is zero for every V and V. Then T is the zero operator. Okay, now, you should be thinking, wait, didn't we already prove this? We proved this, right? If you're always orthogonal to your image, then you're the zero operator, right? But notice the difference in the hypotheses between these two theorems. This one applied to any operator over an inner product space. But that inner product space had to be over C because this result was false over R. This one, you can take any field you want. This result is true over R as well, but you're only looking at self-adjoint operators. Okay, so this result says over C, if any operator is ever always spitting out orthogonal vectors, then it has to be the zero operator. This one is saying over any inner product space, if you have a self-adjoint operator that only spits out orthogonal vectors, it must be the zero vector. It must be the zero operator. 
Okay, so here's the proof. So first of all, if f equals c, then we proved a stronger statement already. Right, in the case that you're over a complex inner product space, you don't need the hypothesis self-adjoint here. We prove this without the hypothesis self-adjoint. So therefore we can assume that F equals R because this is the only, th the only situation in which we don't already have a proof. Okay, and unfortunately, again, this is just a computation. Okay, so now if U and W are in B, then we just take the following thing. You take the inner product t of u plus w comma u plus w minus the inner product of t u minus w and u minus w and you divide it by four. Okay, and then you break up these inner products using additivity. Uh, and what you get is you get one half the inner product, okay, I'll write it with the same, in the same cell, the inner product of T, U, and W plus the inner product of T, W, and U over two. Okay, but since T is self-adjoint, this is now a strong, right, I get to assume self-adjoint, which I didn't get to assume in the previous theorem. The inner product of T, W, and U that's the same thing as the inner product of W and T star U, but I, I'm, I get to assume that T is self-adjoint. And now I can flip this at the expense of a complex conjugate. But now, since I'm working over R, these inner products are all real numbers. So this is T, U, W. So this equality is by, I'm only worried about the real case in, at this moment. Right, so once you've assumed this, this quantity here just becomes the inner product of T, U, and W. Right. So I guess I'm just continuing this. This is equal to just the inner product of T, U, and W. But now, by hypothesis, I'm assuming that the inner product of T, V, and V is always zero. So this is zero, and this is zero. So this means that the inner product of T, U, and W is zero for every U, and W, and V. And again, you just take W to be T of U. This is actually just exactly the same as the end of this proof, right? Take W equals T of U, exactly the same proof implies that T equals zero. Okay, so basically self adjoint operators over any vector space can never always map orthogonally. Okay. So now I want to talk about normal operators again, which I started earlier. So, so let's, uh, let's go back to this. An operator is normal if and only if TV and T star V have the same norm for every vector. Now, again, we said that this operator t star t minus t t star is always a self adjoint operator. So t is normal if only if t star t minus t t star equals zero. But now this is self adjoint. And this result that we just proved says that for self adjoint operators, being zero is the same thing as if you apply them to v, take the inner product with v you get zero for every V and V. 
again, here we only proved one direction, but the converse is, is actually obvious. So this is if and only if you take the inner product of this self adjoint operator applied to V with V is equal to zero for every V and V. Okay, but now you can break this inner, I mean, you can break this expression up over the inner product. So this will be happen if and only if T star T V V equals T T star V V for every V and V. So just break it up and then move it over to the other side. Now, let's let's talk about the expression that we're left with, right? So currently we have we have t is normal if and only if this equality holds. But let's think about this one. So t star t v comma v. This is the same thing as t star of t v comma v. Uh, and then I can move this T star over to the other side by taking the adjoint of T star. So this is equal to T V comma T star star V, but T star star is just T. So in the end, this thing just becomes the norm of T V squared. And you do the exact same thing for the other one. So this, Continuing, this happens if and only if T V squared equals T star V squared for all V and V. But uh, the norm is always a, a non-negative real number. So to say that two non-negative real numbers have equal squares is the same thing as saying that they're the same non-negative real number. So this, has, this happens if only if TV has the same norm as T star V for all V and V. Okay, so here I'm using the fact that the norm of a vector is a non-negative real number. Okay, so the idea that we're trying to get across here is that normal operators are like very closely related to, the, to their adjoints somehow. Geometrically, a normal operator and its adjoint will always send a vector to vectors of at least the same norm. And in fact, that's a property that characterizes all of the normal operators. Okay, so I, you know, it seems like kind of mysterious. The reason we're talking about normal operators is because they play a big role in the spectral theorem, and hopefully. Next time, I think I think I should be able to at least state both spectral theorems. I may not have time to prove the real spectral theorem, but that's okay. Okay, so next time we'll develop a little bit more normal operators because today was mostly self-adjoint operators. And then I'm pretty sure we'll be able to prove the complex spectral theorem and at least state the real spectral theorem. And these are sort of like huge, important theorems. So it's, it's not such a bad way to end, to end the course. All right, something to look forward to.